All right, if you got your Bibles tonight, we're going to hit this next tier on the qualifications of a biblical leader. Qualifications of a biblical leader. Up to this point, we have uh, covered the uh, following things about specifically a bishop. Um, a bishop must be blameless. We covered what that means. He must be the husband of one wife. We understand what that means. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, um, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. We spent a lot of time on that one. Tonight we're going to hit the next part of this in verse 3 that says, No striker. No striker. Now, what does the word striker mean? Does anybody know? Go ahead. I, I spec, it means like uh, uh, abusive or, you know, like abusive to your wife or something like that. It, it ties into that, yes. It, it, it can incorporate and include that. That is one of the things that it includes. But it goes a little broader than that. Okay? Um, a good working definition is not to be violent, not to be quarrelsome argumentative, not to be a smiter or hitter, which would include what you were talking about. But it don't necessarily have to mean abusive physically. It can be abusive verbally. It can be abusive uh, mentally. A lot of people are in relationships today where there's no physical violence and there's no physical uh, abuse but there's mental abuse. There's mental breaking down of the other person to the point where they just lose the fight and desire and will to uh, be their own person and be what they need to be for the Lord. They get so beat down that it just they just become the shell of a person that they used to be. And that's kind of the, the context of what he's saying here. But one of the things I want you to notice here, too, is quarrelsome. Now listen, as a biblical leader, you're going to be tempted to argue with people. I mean, that's just it comes with the territory. Uh, debating, you know, we like to debate. And there's nothing wrong with having a good biblical debate on some things. And uh, I've been to some good debates, and I've, I've watched some people debate some uh, Bible topics and doctrines and issues. Those are good things to do. Uh, Paul did that at times. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, he would debate people. Jesus did it at times when he was debating with the Pharisees and Sadducees. But always remember, you're not arguing just for the sake of arguing. And you're not arguing just to prove that you're right and they're wrong. And you're not arguing just to make yourself look superior to somebody else. There always needs to be an end goal at the end of the argument or at the end of the conversation. And what is that goal? To win them to Jesus Christ, win them to the biblical truth that you're trying to present. And when you see that you've lost that as the goal, end it. Just end it. Don't have time to sit here and just debate to be debating. Don't have time to sit here and just argue to be arguing with you. My goal is to show you the truth. And if you're not willing to open your ears and heart to the truth, and I say I'm not getting anywhere with that, and it's just becoming a personal thing then, then we need to end it. You know. Um, and that's, and that's kind of where it's at. Now, the next thing that you want to notice here in the definition is the smiter part. Now, this is where your Amish people uh, within our, our circles of the Anabaptist groups come in with the um, non-resistance teaching. All right? they, they take this to the extreme of you're not even allowed to be in the military. Okay? You never find an Amish person in the military. You never will. You're probably not going to find any Mennonites from my research and recollection that are in the military is either either they 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 incorporate a teaching called non-resistance, which simply means that we do not take up arms, we do not fight and shed blood. Okay, and their purpose and reasoning behind that is we're called to peace and we're called to 
love people. Now, is the military a necessary evil in their mind? Yes. They're not saying that a military force is not needed. They're just saying that when you convert to Jesus Christ, you are not part of the people that are taking up arms to kill anybody. If you're in the military, they encourage you, look, if, you, if you're asked to take up a weapon and kill somebody, you're to resist. You're not to do it. Um, so that's where they get that from, and I, I don't agree with that, but I will say this. I will say this, and I'm, I'm going to show you something in the Scriptures in a little while that will verify this. There may come a time, I want you to listen to me carefully. I was in the Marine Corps. My brother Earl here, he's in the Marine Corps at one point. And, uh, but I believe there's very possibly soon coming a time when Christians will not be able to enter the armed forces without it being a sin. That's, it's quiet right there. So what do you mean, preacher? I mean, they're going to put some things in your path that you're going to be required to do in order to join, and you're not going to be able to do it morally. And you're not going to be able to do it conscientiously. That's why the early church refused to join. Because one of the things that they were required to do is make sacrifices to idols in order to be in the military. That's why if you read some of the early church writings about the early followers, they said, you're not allowed to join the military. That's the context of it. The context was not that you, we have a problem with you defending your country. We have a problem with you worshiping idols. And we have a problem with you making sacrifices to idols. And we have a problem with you doing things that go against the Holy Scriptures. See? So, it's very possible we may face that again. The way this country is going right now, I would not be surprised if we don't get put in a dilemma somewhere along the way where we have that kind of situation happen again where from the pulpit we're going to have to say, brother, you can't do this and be right with the Lord. You know, we got to, we got to be praying, folks. we got to be praying. So the first part of this we want to look at is the striving part. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now thank God for our military people that love the Lord and love to serve their country and have done it honorably and I appreciate everybody that has and does and uh, obviously I'm not opposed to it. I support our military. We have a veterans ministry here at this church and we raise money for our vets and they sacrifice a lot for this country to be able to live in a free country. But I don't want you to misunderstand what I just said now. I don't want you to say, well, pre that preacher says he's against the military. I didn't say that. Not one time did I say that in anything I just said. I said there may come a time in the near distant, not in the near distant future, but in the near future, where because of the way this government's going, the radicals, the communists, the demonic, possessed people that are running this country right now, will implement things to make it impossible for you as a born-again Christian to be able to join with a good conscience. That's what I said. I put it into context and then run with it. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, 1 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy 2, 14, it says, here in verse 14, it says, of these things put them in remembrance. Okay, put them in remembrance. Here's what he's going to tell them to do. Charge them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Some people just like to argue for the sake of arguing. Some people like to be negative just to be negative. You could say the sky is blue and they'll say it's gray. And it could be just as blue as the blue devils. <laughs> and they'll argue with you about it. Because they just love to hear themselves argue. Now what I'm telling you as a qualification of a biblical leader, that should never be your uh, characteristic or trait. That should never be a trait of yours. 
as a biblical leader, you should be willing to listen to people of different views, different points of view. You may not agree with them. You may not um, go along with what they're saying. But at least hear them out. Because it could be an issue of you just misunderstanding something. And you might find out at the end of the day after listening carefully to what they're saying and then they listen carefully to what you're saying that y'all are actually saying the same thing. You're just going around different ways to get to it. Okay? Some people like to argue because you don't have Baptists over your title. Well, they're wrong because they're not Baptists. Well, listen, folks. <laughs> Heaven's not just full of Baptists. Okay? Heaven's not just full of Pentecostals. Heaven's not just full of Methodists or Presbyterians or whatever other title you want to go by. Heaven's full of born-again sinners that have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they may come from different denominational backgrounds and been born again, but here's the common denominator. They all acknowledge that they were sinners before God and needed the Savior. And as a biblical leader, it will not hurt you to listen to people in other camps. Sometimes you might learn something. You might learn something. Now, I didn't say compromise. I just said listen. I glean stuff from a lot of different people. I do. I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, people ask me all the time. You got all that, that, that book knowledge over there in the library. Who writes those books? And I start naming off you know, different people. You listen to them? No, I didn't say I listened to them. I said I read them. I didn't say I agreed with them. But I at least got an understanding of what they're saying so that when I get in a pulpit and talk about them, I know what I'm talking about. See? I don't just make generalities and just throw things out there and not know what I'm talking about. You have to be that kind of person. If you're going to be a good biblical leader that God can use, you need to research, do your research, make sure it's right, and when you, at the end of the day you're presenting things to people, you're not doing it to just create an argument, you're doing it to have an end goal of winning them to the truth. Amen. The Bible says, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And then he says in the very next verse, the verse we all like to quote, is study. <laughs> How about that, Brother Earl? Amen. So he's telling you, do some research. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needs not be uh, ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See? i tell you something. Some of the people that I've warned from the Jehovah's Witnesses and one from the, the Mormons and one from the Roman Catholic persuasion, etc., etc. I did it because I went into those groups. I knew what they believed. I knew what they were going to say before they said it. And then I knew what scripture was going to come back and answer the objection. And you need to be able to do that. The Bible says you need to be ready to give an answer to every man to ask if the hope is within you. Be ready. Don't, don't come out with this, oh, well, I, I don't want to talk about it. If you ain't got nothing to say, stop arguing. Don't come up with this, I'm right and you're wrong. Who's that going to win? Nobody. Well, you're just a, a, a sneaking Catholic that, uh, you know, is an idol worshiper, and you're never going to win them like that, folks. You're never going to win them like that. There's never been a person won like that. You know what's going to win them? Is you're going to say, look, you teach this. This is, this is what y'all believe, right? And you confirm it. And then you come back over here and say, but the Bible says this. See where I have a problem? I have a problem here. I don't have a problem over here. We're on the same page here. When it comes to abortion, you and I are on the same page. There ain't a Catholic in, in, in America that's conservative, let me clarify that, a conservative Catholic or traditional Catholic that is, uh, str uh, is, is light on abortion. Let me, let me put it that way. They're more adamant and radical anti-abortionists than any Baptist I know. 
You know how I know that, brother? Because every year on January the 23rd, I believe it is, it's January 23rd, and the Roe v. Wade. Is it 22nd? Whatever date that is, because I used to go every year, I just don't remember the date exactly. I'll tell you what, when I went up there and did the marches up there and was marching around up there in Washington, D.C., there would be hundreds of thousands of Catholics up there marching, and there would be just a little, tiny little speck. Maybe Baptist, yeah. Pentecostals. Yeah. And when I come home, I ask these Baptists and these Pentecostals that were getting in pulpits and preach. I said, "Why don't you go up there and march against the uh, radical left and the abortion junk that's going on up there? Why don't you go march?" Well, we can't do that. That's a Catholic thing. How's that a Catholic thing? Yeah. And besides that, well, we don't want to be associated with them. They say, "Well, let me tell you something, folks. Where they're right, go along with them." Amen. Where they're wrong, stand against them. Amen. I didn't say you had to go to Mass with them. <laughs> I didn't say you had to go and carry a bunch of statues around with you with them. I said, where they're right, go along with it. We got some winners in our camp. They're, 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 they're not thinking, brethren. If they're right on an issue, why would you not stand with them on that? Because their strength in numbers. We can argue the differences later, but let's get together where, we, where we're right. And if abortion is a sin, and it is, and if it's a murder, and it is, why ain't more Baptists, why ain't more Pentecostals, why ain't more Charismatics up there marching against this filth? Amen. I just, and why do we keep putting, and this is for the Catholics now, why do we keep putting Catholics in office that claim to be Roman Catholic and they are pro-abortion? That's what I want to ask my Catholic friends. You said who? Oh, let's see. Uh, Ted Kennedy was a Roman Catholic. Joe Biden's a Roman Catholic. Nancy Pelosi's a Roman Catholic. Let me keep going. You know what every one of them people are doing right now? They're pushing the homosexual agenda on you, which is supposed to be against the official teachings of the Catholic Church. They're pushing the radical pro-abortion agenda on you, which is supposed to be totally against the Roman Catholic Church. And they're getting away with it because people that are lay people are opening their mouth and opposing it. And they're putting these scandals in there and they keep voting them in. And they got such a foothold in, in, in power now, it makes you sick. Just because they got an R behind their name, don't give them a pass either. We got some people with R's behind their name that just went along with this marriage act junk that Biden signed. It was bipartisan. You know what that means? That means we got a bunch of rhinos on our side that don't have any guts or backbone. Amen. They're a bunch of wolves in sheep's clothing. I know this probably won't get on YouTube, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We'll put it on Rumble. Yeah, put it on Rumble. Put it somewhere where it'll actually get heard. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Go down to verse uh, 24. Get to rambling and get like a... Like Brother Rutman said, the junkyard dog starts foaming at the mouth. Look at verse uh, 24. The Bible says, And the servant, excuse me, the servant, well, let's go back to verse 20. Let's get some context here. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from thee, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Let me stop right there. You see that part about fleeing youthful lust? In case some people are uh, wanting to listen to this on CD or listen to this on the website, let me just talk to some of our uh, young crowd and our middle-aged crowd and whoever else wants to take uh, part of listening to what I'm getting ready to say. Let me tell you something. If you're looking for a good spouse, you're not going to find them in a bar. Amen. 
If you're looking for a good spouse, you're not going to find them out there living like the devil. You're going to find them somewhere where they're loving Jesus Christ and fall in love with the Lord. If you want to find a good person, listen to me. You've got to flee youthful lust and follow after righteousness. Put God first. Jesus Christ said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these other things shall be added unto you. You've got to put God first. You cannot put the cart before the horse. You've got to have the cart behind the horse. And you've got to put Jesus Christ in front and let Him pull the wagon. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a what? Pure heart. heart. You've got to have a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Think about that. There's some people that will come to you that want to irritate you with, with just stupid stuff. They know the answer. They just want to see... How are you going to respond to their stupidity? Now, I'm not talking about people that have sincere questions and really want to know things. But you know the difference. You know the difference between somebody that's really seeking the truth or seeking really to find some answers to some things they're wondering about in the Bible and then that crowd that's just trying to mock you and trying to trip you up. And there's a big difference. And the Bible says here that you, the foolish and unlearned questions of boredom I ain't got time to even answer. I ain't going to give you time of day. Stupid. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Avoid knowing that they do gender what? Right. And what does the next part say? The servant of the Lord. That would be you. This would be a leader. The servant of the Lord must not strive. That is not your goal in life is to be... I know some, listen to me, I know some preachers. Let me just make an even more general statement. I know some Christians that all they want to do in life is be negative. They want to find fault with everybody and everything around them. And their whole purpose in life when they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed is to find something to argue about find something negative to complain about, and they're looking for things to be uh, gender of strife. And your Bible tells you the servant of the Lord should not strive. He must not strive, actually, is what it says. But be gentle unto all men. Now that's going to require some patience on your part. Because... Everybody ain't easy to get along with. And there's some difficult people out there that you're going to have to minister to at times. And the Lord's going to have to give you some patience to know what to say to them, how to say it to them, and how much at one time to say to them. Sometimes you can be saying the right thing but too much of it to them and it still create a problem. You got to know how much to measure it out. It's kind of like a baby on a bottle. You got to know how much to give them. And then you got to know when to pull it away from them. Because if you don't pull that bottle away in time, they'll get colic. Then they'll be up all night complaining. And you'll be complaining too. I promise. The Bible says be gentle unto all men. You got to be gentle to them, gently lead them. You know, um, sometimes that's going to require you to uh, be patient with them when, when it's difficult and you're going to have to uh, be understanding with them when they're not exactly where you think they ought to be or where you ought to, they may not dress the way you think they ought to dress. They may not be doing everything you think they ought to be doing, but you've got to be gentle with them. Act to teach. We already talked about that. You need to be, be apt to teach, equipped to teach them. While you're dealing with them, you need to know what to say to them. 
You need to know a little bit about them and where they are spiritually and, and what to say to them in regards to where they are spiritually. And listen, no two people are alike. What you say to this one right here, you may not be able to say to this one right here. You may be able to feed this one this amount, but you may be able to only give this one just a little smaller amount. Amen. You may focus on one thing here with this one while you focus something totally different over here with this one. And that's where discernment comes in. See? And if you're not careful, the devil will take those kinds of situations and use it to bring strife into the equation and you'll lose both of them. See? And that's where being a pastor becomes a calling. <laughs> Understand what I'm saying? Because in a congregation, big or small, it don't matter, you've got all kinds of personalities in that congregation and you have to be able to know how to deal with each and every one of those personalities individually and collectively and make it work. And that's why a lot of churches fall apart because the pastor does not know how to do that a lot of times. He's not equipped. He ain't been trained on that. He ain't spent that time before the Lord to get that discernment. And if there's one thing I would encourage you to pray and ask God to give you in, in, in the area of wisdom and knowledge and understanding is discernment. Know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Alright? In meekness, verse 25, instructing those that oppose themselves. You're going to run into that crowd. you got to do it meekly, though. And that's a fine line, too. You know, um, we were at a Christmas party uh, the other night, you know, and, and my wife is very meek when it comes to people that she sees that need some attention from the Lord. I, and I'm like that to a point. I mean, I don't like to see people be depressed and I want to fix them. That's a good quality and in meekness, you have to go to some people that have had a hard life. You have to look past that surface where they're at physically, mentally, emotionally, and go past that and look down into the soul of that person and say, all right, there's a soul there that God wants to save. And there's a soul there that's broken and shattered that needs help. And I could argue here Okay, because they've got all the the walls up and they come at you with that combative, you know, because they know you're religious. But when you get past that and you get down it and then you get down in there where they are and then you can minister to them. And that's what he's saying here. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Again, your end goal is always going to be the same. It's to bring the truth to them. And that they may receive, uh, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, they got these little slogans. What would Jesus do? <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what Jesus would do. Now, don't mistake meekness for weakness. And don't mistake what we're talking about, about not striving as being a pushover. There are going to be times you're going to have to get loud. There are going to be times where you're going to have to Stand your ground and be boisterous and let people know, hey, I stand for the Lord. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Those kind of moments do come in the life of the ministry. But when you're, you've got to, again, this is an area where you're going to have to have discernment. You, you understand what I'm saying? You're going to have to have that discernment to know when to speak and when not to speak, when to be tough and when not to be tough. It's just like with your children. You have to know when to be gentle with them and when to be firm with them. You have to know when to, come here, son, let me give you a kiss, and then another time say, come here, son, let me give you a whooping. See? And out of both of those situations, it should be coming from a 
heart of love with a end result being the same at the end of the day and that is putting them under the authority of Jesus Christ. See? Whether it be by meekness or whether it be by firmness. Alright, take your Bible and look at 12 verse 19. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, talking about Jesus. Let's go back a few verses here. Look at verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit, notice that spirit's not capitalized, upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive, nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. In other words, Jesus wasn't out there just bringing attention to himself, just to be bringing attention to himself. He walked over there in the streets, walking down the street, saying, Look at me. Look at who I am. I'm the Messiah. You need to bow down. He didn't go out of his way to draw that kind of attention to himself. Every step he took, every place he went was on purpose. and had a goal in mind. And that was to win them to the truth. When it says he did not strive, he didn't go out there and become argumentative. Now, were there times that he argued? Yes, there was. Was it warranted? Yes, it was. A lot of times he didn't start it, but he sure finished it. Remember that. Sometimes that might be the situation with you. You may not start it, but you need to know how to finish it. Amen. I had a lady come to me one time when I was street preaching. She just knew she was going to straighten me out, brother. I mean, and I knew what it was. It was an evil spirit that had sent that woman over there to disrupt what I was doing to get me off focus. So I quit street preaching and focus on her. Excuse me, lady. I'm busy. I'll be happy to talk to you, but not now. I'm here doing my father's business. That's exactly what I told her. But, 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 no, there ain't no buts. You want to talk to me? I end at 2 o'clock. Come see me then. Do you think she came? No. Her goal was just to stop what I was doing. She didn't want to know why I was doing what I was doing. She didn't want to know uh, anything about us. She was not interested in any of that. All she wanted to do was try to shame me into stopping what I was doing because I was doing harm to the body of Christ. I'm bringing a reproach on the Lord. You know, she talked like that. You know what that is? That's an evil spirit talking through somebody. When you hear them with those drawn out words like that, there's something demonic going on with them. Amen. I just love the Lord. You need an exorcist. (laughs) And I'll be available at 2 (laughs) o'clock. If you want to come back. But anyway... Uh, you got to discern, don't let people get you sidetracked just in arguments to get you off kilter. Because a lot of times when you're teaching things, even if you're doing one-on-one teaching with people, this is where this becomes important. When you're trying to teach, say, for example, the deity of Christ or whatever subject that you decide that you're wanting to do one-on-one with somebody that wants to learn the Bible, inevitably, the devil will get that person, a lot of times, to get you sidetracked over here off on a rabbit trail somewhere, get you off subject on an argumentative thing that has nothing to do with what you're talking about. And what you have to do is you have to get them back around to where you are so that we can focus on what we're talking about and then tell them, look, if you want to talk about that subject, we can talk about that later. But I don't have the time right now to talk about that because we're talking about this. 
and stay focused. Or you'll have people wanting to just bring you over here somewhere. Jehovah's Witnesses are real good for that. They'll start you off on a scripture and want you to explain it to them. And then when you start explaining it, as soon as you start hitting the nail where it's supposed to be hit at, they'll jump off on something else. They won't let you finish what you're talking about here. And what they do in that is they're, they're, they're getting you diverted like that so they can get argumentative with you, get you confused, and then they become the authority. See? Same spirit. It's a religious spirit. Take your Bible and go to Proverbs. Chapter 3. Now remember I said there are times that Jesus did strive. But it was always a purpose behind it. There's got to be a cause, folks. And you've got to have an end result at the end of it that's worth you doing it. Not just do it, be doing it. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 30. Now I'm going to give you some examples with this verse. The Bible says here in Proverbs 3.30, it says, Strive not with a man. What's that next part say? Without cause. Without cause. I'm telling you, there's people... That, that they spend their whole life, their whole mission in life is to wake up and try to find something to argue about. They, don't, they can't even tell you why they like to argue. You just love to do it. When I was in school, when I was a young kid about Samuel's age, I just loved to fight. I did. I, I used to love to fight. Sister, I mean, I'd love to fight. I mean, I'd get, my whole goal in life was to go to the playground and find somebody to fight with. <laughs> I got up in the morning thinking about it went to bed thinking about it <laughs> who am I going to fight with tomorrow <laughs> and I found my match with a young man by the name of Jason and, uh, and he loved it just as much as us so we wound up fighting each other all the time <laughs> we were fighting at tomorrow <laughs> meet me over here at the monkey bars <laughs> you know <laughs> we couldn't even tell you why we were fighting we just loved to do it and that's the way it is with some people in church that love to argue all the time. They'll come in and they're looking for people to find fault with. I don't like that shirt you're wearing. We're tough. Just don't look at it. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I don't know. Why would you wake up this morning? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you could throw it back at them, but then it creates a bigger problem because then they want to argue some more, you know. What you have to do in those situations is, look, man, you know, I'm, I'm here because I love the Lord. I'm not perfect. I'm glad you noticed my flaws, and I'm working on The Lord works, is working on me every day. And I promise you, if you look in the mirror hard enough, you'll find some things wrong with you too. <laughs> and just, just watch them. After you say something like that. The Bible says, Strive not with a, with a man without cause. If you have done thee no harm. See? And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people not in church today because of people like that. They turned them off before they could get turned on. And causes them to leave church and never want to come back. i tell you what, there's a lot of people that and, and their families, their families don't even want to be around them because of their negativity. Everything in life, folks, is not negative. Every battery has a positive and a negative. Every battery. Or it ain't a battery. Or it's a dead battery. That's right. <laughs> you got to have some positive and you got to have some negative. And you got to look at some things about people, maybe even people you don't agree with, uh, doctrinally or spiritually or whatever it is and look at some of the positive things that they have going on in their life and compliment them. Compliment them. 
By this shall all men know you are my disciples by the love you have one toward another. You got to show love one towards another, right? And that love should spew out to the people that you're trying to reach. If they never see any love toward one another here, obviously that's going to be a turn off. But if they come inside that church door right there, I don't care what they look like. Don't run them off. Don't kill them before we can get them one. I don't care if they got hair, if a guy comes in here and he's got hair all the way down to the floor, dragging the back of the floor. I'm glad he's there. I'm glad he's here. If he's in a t-shirt, awesome. You know. I don't care if if his face looks like a pin cushion. <laughs> he had to have a reason for getting here, didn't he? He didn't just show up one day. Something drew him here. Now, who or who in the congregation wants to be guilty before God of having that person's blood on their hand before God can get them under the preaching of the Word of God and get them saved? And get them right. See? When, when you first got saved, when I first got saved, we didn't arrive at that moment. There's a lot of things. If you think back from the first day you were saved to now, boy, there's been a lot of change in heaven. I mean, a lot of changing. I mean, there's a lot of baggage that God kind of overlooked in your life after you were saved that if He'd have tore your hide like you should have been tore, you'd have been in trouble, right? So give some other people some grace. Give them the same grace God gave you. Let the preacher do his job and you do yours by loving and welcoming and, and showing them what it is to be a Christian. I, I, I get so amazed at that, brother. You know what I'm talking about, too. I do. I, I'm telling you. And I look at people and I think, you, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. Let's go to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Here's another one that's good. Right down the same corridor of ideas. You know what that's a sign of? It's a sign of an evil heart. There's something wrong with the heart of a person that's always got that in their heart to do. When I got saved, brother, I quit fighting. That's much. <laughs> I didn't wake up every morning wanting to fight and go to bed wanting to fight after that. When I got saved at 10, man, God changed me. I started migrating away from that. I started start seeing people the way Jesus sees them. Compassion. Don't your Bible tell you when he looked on the multitude, he said he was moved with compassion for them? Because they were like a bunch of sheep without a shepherd. I drive down the road sometimes and I look at these big churches and stuff and think about the stuff that's going on in some of these places and think about some of the junk that they're uh, exposing themselves to and all that stuff. Sometimes I get angry, furious, but then that anger and that fury, brother Earl, turns to pity and compassion. A bunch of sheep in there, man, that have no clue what's going on. And they need a shepherd. And there's no shepherd. Alright, Proverbs 25, 8. Look at this. Proverbs 25, 8. The Bible says here in verse 8, the Bible says, Go not forth hastily. To strive. That means don't go out there in a hurry trying to find something to argue about. Lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Somebody's going to be out there that knows a little bit more than you know. And they're going to put you to shame. They're going to shut you up before you get started good. I've watched that happen to Christians. I've watched some Christians get so arrogant and so proud and so haughty that they think they can just handle anything and they don't spend any time studying, they don't spend any time in prayer, they don't spend any time before the Lord and they just run right out into the traffic, man. And they get their lunch handed to them. And they go home with their tail tucked between their legs. How'd that happen, preacher? How did they show me up like that? Well, first of all, you went to them with the wrong attitude. 
You didn't go to them because you're trying to win them to the Lord. You went to them just to prove a point. You went to them to make yourself look superior to them. You went to them because you were trying to show everybody around you how smart you are and how dumb they are. And that's pride and that's arrogance and that's haughtiness. And God will deal with that. And the Bible says a haughty spirit goes before fall and pride goes before destruction. And that goes for a Christian too. And you go running out there just because you're trying to prove that you're right and they're wrong, don't do it. Spend some time in prayer about that situation before you go to it. Amen. When I was dealing with the um, Jehovah's Witnesses in my past, uh, when I've had connections with them and stuff, let me tell you something, folks. I spent a lot of time researching and praying and asking God to help me put something together so that when I sat down with them, it won't just who had the best argument. It was, I'm really sincerely trying to reach you and get you out of something that's dangerous and detrimental to your soul. God had to show me, you've got to love this person into Christ while you're showing them something about the truth. Let me tell you something, folks. When I was, uh, first started in the insurance business, I'll show you, share you a little story. I had a man uh, by the name of Harold Cardwell. Loved him to pieces. He's passed on now. He's going to be with the Lord. I just got out of insurance school, Brother Earl, and I was an arrogant little rascal. Man, I just knew, I knew it all, man. I just got out of insurance school. I thought I was going to conquer the world. I mean, nobody was going to be able to tell me no. And nobody, I was going to sell anybody I came in front of. They were going to buy some insurance from me. That was my attitude. And as soon as I got out of school, I hopped in the car with him, and he was going to show me this route, you know, that we were going to do for the uh, insurance. And he pulled off the side of the road. He said, Mark, I want to give you your first lesson in insurance right now. I said, what's that? Tell me. Because it probably ain't something I already, ain't already heard in school. He said, no, this is something you, you haven't heard and you need to hear. He said, number one, forget everything you learn. He said, and never forget this. He said, this will carry you through in life no matter what you do, no matter what field you go into, no matter where you go in life and who you come in contact with. And he looked at me dead in my face. He said, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Never forget that. Never forget that. If they get the slightest inkling that you don't care about them, they don't care how much knowledge you give them, they are going to tune you out. But if they know you care about them, you might stumble through everything. But they know you're doing it out of love, they'll soak up every word you got to say. And they'll trust you with their dying breath. I ain't never forgot that. I carried that in the ministry. I've carried that in my day-to-day -day dealings with people in workplaces I've worked in. And I try to practice that on a daily basis. I ain't never forgot it. And when you're out there trying to minister to people as a biblical leader, always remember that. You want to give them your heart first. Never forget that. You must show them that you are genuinely there because you care about their soul. All right. Where are we at? Proverbs 25 8. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. 25 8. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've already, we, we talked about that. Now look at verse 9. It just says, Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. In other words, you got an issue with him, just talk to him about it. Debate. If you got a debate, you know, hash it out. Go out there and blab it to everybody. Get with him about it. Get it settled. Get it straight. Get it fixed. Debating is not a sin. Unless you're debating just for the sake of debating. 
Now, like I said, I've been in some good Bible debates before. Enjoyed them. Had fun with them. And among Christians, by the way. And the thing that um, impressed me about some and didn't about others is how they responded to each other after the debate. How did you respond after the debate? Were you a gentleman? I can disagree with anybody and still have a conversation with them after the fact and not skip a beat. Think that they're absolutely wrong on every point that they said and then smile at them and let's go have some lunch together. I was joking about this one time and I heard a preacher say this one time and this stuck with me too. He said, listen, he was debating another preacher that believed you could lose your salvation. And of course, we believe you, when you're saved, you're saved forever. You can't lose it. We got Bible to back up what we're saying, and they got a lot of scriptures that seem to back up what they're saying, but we know what that's about. That's rightly dividing. It's dispensational. That's the way you understand it. But with that being said, them two are arguing. <laughs> and they said, you know, if the Lord had come at that moment, they'd have finished that argument on the way up to heaven. Now think about that. <laughs> They'd have kept right on going until they got to the top and the Lord straightened both of them out. <laughs> but they'd have went. You know why? Because they had a love for one another. They were disagreeing on something that they were both passionate about, but they disagreed in a loving manner. Some things, you know, you can disagree with, but it don't mean that you've got to stop talking to that person. I've got some Pentecostal friends that I love to pieces. We disagree on a lot of doctrinal issues. I got a cousin right now that has an amazing celebrate recovery program that he does, and he's a Pentecostal, and I love him to pieces, and I think he does a great job in helping people that are coming out of drug addictions, alcohol addictions, and all kinds of other addictions. And I would not take that from him for nothing in the world. I think what he's doing there is a good thing. See? Do I agree with him on the other stuff? No, not necessarily. But he's saved. He loves the Lord. You take the uh, church here in Goldsboro that does Judgment House. Brother, I think it's a great thing. I, I've seen it. I've watched people go through that thing and get saved. Now, do I think every little piece and cramp, the little thing in it is exactly right? Maybe not. Maybe it ain't. But you know what? When they put that thing together, they did it out of love for one thing. They were trying to win people to Christ. And there's been a lot of people go through there. We've took some of our kids when we were in Mount Olive over there and they got saved, some of them. Remember that, Carrie? Who puts it together? PH Church. Now, am I going to go over there and and, and, and get in their services and talk in tongues with them? No. No, I'm not. I'll give you another one. i got a good brother in Christ right now. And I'm just pouring my heart out to you for a little bit, okay? I'm trying to give you some examples here. I'll put myself out there where some of them may not. <laughs> uh, i got another brother who's a free will Baptist that I love... And if he called me right now and needed me, I would be there for him. And he's come and preached for us over at, um, on the tram road before. And do you know I got some slack and some flack, rather, from a bunch of the brothers in the independent Baptist movement, and they refused to fellowship with me after that because I allowed a <coughs> free will Baptist to come and preach as a guest speaker in my pulpit? Wow. Boy, you don't have no grace, do you? What if Jesus treated you that way? Just because we disagree on something like that doesn't mean He can't come and preach something that we both agree on. And look, we joked about it a little bit. We had a little fun with it. We picked on each other about it a little bit. 
He don't, he's not a King James only guy. He knows I am, and you know what he did? He was very respectful. He said, I will not come in your pulpit, and I will not use any Bible but the King James while I'm there. And I appreciated that. I appreciated that. What were you trying to do there, brother? I was just trying to extend a hand in love to my brother in Christ that I love and think a lot of, and we have a history together. That's what that was. I know some of the brethren wouldn't, wouldn't go across the street for some of these guys. And that's a shame. And you're going to have to give an account for that on the day of judgment. You're going to have to give an account for that on the day of judgment. Alright. Take Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 13. Colossians 3.13 Boy, when they hear this one, they're going to they're gonna flip sideways. Some of them. They're going to have a heart attack. You, 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 you done committed two par- uh, unpardonable sins. You let a man in your pulpit that was a free will Baptist and a man that, was, that wasn't necessarily a King James only guy. I don't make a habit of that, folks. I guard my pulpit pretty good. But I'm I'm also a man that um, has a lot of understanding and compassion for people and and opening up doors so that we can have that discussion. We're never going to have that discussion if we keep shutting the door in each other's face. Colossians 3, verse 13. The Bible says, well, let's look up verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, and that's the key, as, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Gain mercy in your life. Kindness, how about that? Humbleness of mind, there's that meekness. Long suffering, forbearing one another, that means put up with one another. <laughs> Forgiving one another. Do you forgive one another? If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Look, there's going to be times when you have disagreements with your brothers and sisters in Christ at times. There's going to be times when you're out there and there's going to be some things that said that you may not like and disagree with on things. But the Bible says you're to forgive one another. You're to love one another. You're to forbear one another. Put up with one another. Jesus puts up with you. Amen. He puts up with you from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. And He puts up with you while you're sleeping. We can put up with one another. We need to show some love to each other. God help us to get to a place where we can have that unity of the faith based on the Holy Scriptures and the Word of God that is true and real and from the heart. The Bible says, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Um, Go to Matthew 5, 39. We're going a little bit over, not much. I've got a couple of more things I want to read here before we close. Matthew 5.39, we'll read them quickly. 5.39. That smiting part, brother. Matthew 5, 39, the Bible says, But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Very familiar passage. But remember, the context is people that are doing you wrong for the cause of the Lord, righteous, a righteous cause. 
That doesn't mean you can't defend your property. That doesn't mean you don't defend your family if they're in harm's way. That doesn't mean that you just let somebody come in and hurt your children or hurt your wife or hurt your spouse or whatever. That it does mean that when you're in the cause of doing something righteous for the Lord and somebody comes in and they smite you off of the other, like Christ did. Remember when he was smitten by the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, he didn't resist. He didn't fight. He said, let him do it. We're to walk by that same rule. We're not to resist evil. That don't mean that we give in to evil as far as doing evil things, but it means that we, um, we don't resist in a combative way those that are doing evil to us. That's what it's talking about. You don't become combative towards them. You let the love of God that's on the inside of your heart pour out and then they see that love and it brings conviction to them. It heaps coals of fire on their heads. Take your Bible and go to James. I believe it's in James. Maybe it's not James. Hold on a minute. I'll tell you where it's at. Maybe in Romans. Let me look and see real quick. And we'll close with this verse here. Uh, it's going to be... Romans 12. Romans 12, 20. Look at, uh, we're going to go back a few verses. We're going to go back over here at verse 16 and start there. And this kind of sums up the whole thing. And this kind of should be your guide in your day-to-day -day walk as you're striving to please the Lord. Remember, these things we talk about are about pleasing God. And in pleasing God, we must remember that we are to exhibit the characteristics of His nature in our life. The Bible says here in verse 16, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. That's basically kind of summarizing what we've already talked about. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That's a whole other sermon. You ought to do right just because it's right. You don't steal. You don't take things that belong to other people. Even if somebody is not watching you, you ought to do right even if nobody's in the room. And there's a lot of Christians. Well, nobody sees you. It don't matter if they see me or not. God sees me. I get people to tell me stuff like that sometimes. Well, nobody sees what you, you know. Nobody's going to see that. Really? God sees all things. Verse 18, But if it be possible as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, he put that in there that way because there's going to be some times, brother, it's not possible. There's going to be just some people that come in your path that you're going to have to separate yourself from. That's where we get the word disfellowshipping from. And there's going to be some people in your path that's going to be a detriment to the cause of Christ. And you've got to separate and distance yourself from those people. Because you can't live peaceably with them. And God will show you the difference. Some people you can just have to put up with them. And they're irritating, they're a thorn in your side at times, but you can put up with them. <laughs> a lot of patience. God sent them your way just to give you a little bit of patience. The Bible says here, live peaceably with all men, but it's not always possible. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place in the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now remember, that's in Romans, that's not in Matthew. You don't have to take vengeance on people. When they do wrong to you, you don't take it in your own hand to pay them back. That is not a characteristic of a Christian. We don't go around trying to pay people back for what they've done wrong to us. We put it in God's hand on the altar and let God 
avenge you. I've seen situations where God done some things that if the other person had tried to do it, they couldn't have matched it if they tried. And God did it in such a way where no question about who did it. The Bible says, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place in the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And you can count on it. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. <laughs> Boy, that's hard, ain't it? That's a hard one to swallow sometimes. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let me tell you something. When people do you wrong, and they mistreat you, and they say bad things about you, if you'll go out of your way and be nice to them, and do good things to them when it's not warranted, I'm telling you, you'll have such an impact on them. They'll get under such conviction. They'll either get right or get out. It'll happen. And you do right before the Lord, God will put the light on it. And we'll stop right there because it's 10 after. Hope you all got some good stuff out of this tonight. So, with that, we'll close right there. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank You for Your blessings tonight. Thank You, Lord, for what You teach us in Your Word about not being a striker. And Lord, that you'll help us to put that into our daily practice as a believer and help us not to be quarrelsome, help us not to be a smiter or a striker and uh, argumentative and combative. But Lord, that in our day-to-day -day dealings with our words and in our actions, Lord, that people will see Jesus in us in every aspect of our lives and that they will see the gentleness of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.